or one that I would refer to as logically completes the text. There's no two ways about these. You have to read the whole thing. You have to think carefully about the entire idea, the premises, the assumptions, the hypotheses that lead up to the final sentence. And we're always going to answer the question of how can the first part of the final sentence be true given those hypotheses or premises beforehand. And you need to fill in the blank or find the most reasonable answer. So let's begin. Marta Cole and colleagues, 2010 Mediterranean Sea Biodiversity Census report approximately 17,000 species, nearly double the number reported in Bianchi and Mori's 2000 census. So they reported twice as many species. A difference only partly attributable to the description of new invertebrate species. So it's not due to anything new or new species. Another factor is that the morphological variability of microorganisms is poorly understood compared to that of vertebrates, invertebrates, plants, and algae, creating uncertainty about how to evaluate microorganisms as species. So basically plants, animals, we can delineate as species, but microorganisms, who knows? It's just hard to tell. Researchers' decisions on such matters, therefore, can be highly consequential. Indeed, here's our final sentence. The two census reported similar counts of vertebrate, plant, and algal species. So where it's easy to tell species, they agreed, suggesting that the differences, the double count, the one versus the other, is due to classifying microorganisms as species. That's going to be the key idea in the answer. So let's look at the answer choices. Cole and colleagues reported a much higher number of species they did, that's true, then Bianchi and Moore did largely due to the inclusion of invertebrate. No, no, it's not due to the inclusion of invertebrates. It tells us up above that there were no new invertebrate species. A is wrong. B, some differences observed in microorganisms may have been treated as variations within species by Bianchi and Mori, who had the lower census number, but treated as indicative of distinct species by Cole and colleagues. That would have given them the higher double Number, it looks like B is going to be the right answer. I'm gonna circle that, but let's check C and D first. Bianchi and Mori may have been less sensitive to the degree of morphological variation displayed within a typical species of microorganism than Cole and colleagues were. So let's be careful about this. This seems appealing as well, almost very similar to B. Bianchi were less sensitive to the degree of morphological variation displayed. So does that mean they would not have categorized new species within a typical species than Cole and colleagues? Cole and colleagues were more sensitive to more morphological variation. Well, I'm not sure. That might actually be the opposite of B. In either case, Less sensitive is not clear. Less sensitive to the degree. What exactly does that mean? That's just simply not definitive or clear. Whereas B just clearly says they treat it as variations as new species or not new species. And that's what we care about. So C is not going to be the correct answer. D, the absence of clarity regarding how to differentiate among species of microorganisms there is an absence of clarity, may have resulted in Cole underestimating. No, Cole had the higher number. They did not underestimate. That's just factually incorrect. The correct answer here is B. Two, researchers recently found that disruptions to an enjoyable experience, like a short series of advertisements during a television show, often increase viewers' reported enjoyment. So if I'm enjoying my show and I have these annoying commercials come in, this suggests I'm actually happier, which seems odd. Okay. Suspecting that disruptions to an unpleasant experience would have the opposite effect. The researchers had participants listen to construction noise for 30 minutes. That would be an example of something annoying. Anticipated those whose listening experience is frequently interrupted with short breaks of silence. Well, normally you'd think the silence would be a relief but according to the first premises it would make you more angry or more upset so that's what we need to find is the answer choice so more angry or upset a less enjoyable experience which choice most logically completes the text find the disruptions more irritating as time went on so the short breaks of silence 
would thus make me more angry or more irritated. Whoa, as time goes on. So I almost chose this. It looks good. It's kind of the guest answer I would have made, but I'm not sure if this is time goes on part. It never says anything about time up here. It just says reported enjoyment. Let's check the other answers before we circle that. B, rate the listening experience as more negative than those whose listening experience was uninterrupted. Yes. So it would make you more angry or more negative than a control group where the experience was uninterrupted. That would be a definitive indicator of that particular experience or observation being true. B, looks like it's going to be the right answer. Again, A is slightly problematic. So notice wrong answers will sometimes go in the same direction, kind of the same guess of logic, but something particular about them is wrong. So you got to be careful about that. C, rate the experience of listening to construction noise as lasting for less time. No, less time. It's not about time. That's why C is wrong. And let's just check D, perceive the volume of the construction noise as growing softer over time. Now, again, it's not about growing softer. It's about the enjoyment of the experience. So C and D are wrong as is A. B is the correct answer. Okay, this is logically completes the text. We're going to read the text. We're going to make a guess at the end of how the final sentence could be true, given the premises beforehand, and then we'll have to match it to an answer. That's our general approach here. So many of William Shakespeare's tragedies address broad themes that still appeal to today's audiences. So the themes appeal to today. For instance, Romeo and Juliet, which is set in the Italy of Shakespeare's time, tackles the themes of parents versus children. That's a theme. And love versus hate, another broad theme. And the play continues to be read and produced widely around the world. Why? Because these themes still exist today. But understanding Shakespeare's so-called history plays can require a knowledge of several centuries of your English history. So if you didn't have that knowledge, you probably wouldn't enjoy it as much as the plays where you can relate because those issues still, love versus hate, exist today. So consequently, most people would not relate to history plays. Or they prefer the romantic plays. Let's see the answer choices. Many theater goers and readers today are likely to find Shakespeare's history plays less engaging than the tragedies. Yes. That's exactly what we guessed is the answer. Now, let's be careful again, as we've noticed in other problems like this, there might be another answer in the same, with the same kind of guessed response, and it may or may not be better than the answer. So always check the other answers. Some of Shakespeare's tragedies are more relevant to today's audiences than 20th century plays. Than 20th century plays? No, that's an incorrect comparison. That's toward modern plays. That's wrong. C, Romeo and Juliet is the most thematically accessible of Sha most thematically accessible. That's extreme language. I have no idea if that's true or not. That's unlikely. And so that's going to be a wrong answer. Experts in English history tend to prefer Shakespeare's history plays to his other works. Well, this says nothing about experts in English history above. That's not a conclusion you can make from what's provided in the passage or the paragraph. That's not the answer. Okay, we've got a logically completes text problem. Again, we're going to start by reading the paragraph. Can't get around that because we've got to consider very carefully what the premise, the hypothesis is. And then we've got to read the first part of the last sentence and answer or fill in why and how that can be true and find the match among the answer choices. So we generally try to guess the answer. So let's begin that. In the early 19th century, some Euro-American farmers in the northeastern U.S. used agricultural techniques developed by the Iroquois people centuries earlier. But it seems that few of those farmers had actually seen the Iroquois, the Haudenosaunee, farms firsthand. So they knew how to do it, but they hadn't actually directly met them. Barring the possibility of several farmers of the same era independently developing techniques of the Haudenosaunee people, so the, the idea that it was chance that they worked the same way. These facts suggest that the Euro-American farmers had to learn indirectly from somebody else, right? Who did know them or was passing down their techniques. 
So let's check the answer options. Those farmers learn the techniques from other people, that's indirectly, who are more directly influenced by the Howden no Sawney practices, that is the Iroquois. That looks good. We're going to check the other answer choices because we know one wrong answer type often uses the same guess or the same idea. And we want to be very careful we have the right one. B, the crops typically cultivated by Euro-American farmers in the Northeastern US were not well suited to Iroquois farming techniques. I don't know how that's a conclusion at all. In fact, why would Euro-Americans copy their techniques if that were true? That doesn't make sense. Howden Sani farming techniques were widely used in regions outside the Northeast US. Well, what does that have to do with Euro-Americans farming in the US? That's irrelevant. Euro-American farmers only began, only began, that's a little extreme, to recognize the benefits of Iroquois, I'm gonna say, farming techniques late in the 19th century. Okay, that has nothing to do with the idea of the timing. We already know that they did it later than the Iroquois. I'm not sure how the particular date is pertinent here because no dates are given up above. So we cannot draw conclusions. It's simply something that is not in the passage or not helpful to answer. A is the correct answer. Okay, another logically completes the text prompt. Let's read the passage, make our guess, and compare it to the answer choices. The domestic sweet potato descends from a wild plant native to South America. It also populates the Polynesian islands, where evidence confirms that native Hawaiians and other indigenous peoples were cultivating the plants centuries before seafaring first occurred over the thousands of miles of oceans. So we had it start here in South America, and somehow it got out to the Polynesian islands, and it did it before any boats came across. Hmm. To explain how the sweet potato was first introduced in Polynesia, botanist Pablo Munoz Rodriguez and colleagues analyzed the DNA of numerous varieties of the plant, concluding that Polynesian varieties diverged from South American ones over a hundred thousand years ago. Given that Polynesia was peopled only in the last 3,000 years, the team concluded, okay, the people could not have brought them from South America to Polynesia because they only came 3,000 years ago. It was 100,000 years ago, so it must have come from birds or on the wind or, or somehow, some other mechanism of transfer. Okay, let's see if we can find the match. The cultivation of the sweet potato in Polynesia likely predates its cultivation. No, it didn't come before South America. We're pretty sure South America came first. Polynesian peoples likely acquired the sweet potato from South American peoples. No, because they didn't know each other. It came over 100,000 years ago. So the Polynesians were only there 3,000 years ago. That can't be true. Human activity likely played no role in the introduction of the sweet potato. Yeah, they came from non-human sources. That's it. Human activity played no role in the introduction of the sweet potato. That's the only thing we can conclude. Let's just check D. Polynesian sweet potato varieties likely descend from a single South American variety that was demand. How do we know that? Those details are just simply not available in the passage and no conclusion can be made. C is the right answer.